Okay. Wow. I'm very excited. I'm very pumped. I've been pumped for the last three hours. There's a lot of adrenaline rush in me. So um, I'm glad some of you stayed, because probably the worst is the last. Um, I'll, my name is Anna Saloum, and I am a prosthodontist um, who also places implants, and I'm a lab technician. I'll tell you just a bit about where, um, where I come from. This is not working. That's fine. Yellow one, okay. Oh, no, this, this, okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about implant uh, prosthodontics. As a prosthodontist and uh, as being exposed to lab technology a lot, um, I'll talk about uh, the pros part. Now, I'm going to concentrate a lot on full arch restorations. I live in uh, Abu Dhabi. It's a small city. Um, in the Emirates, um, I work with my dad, and I'm just going to take you 34 years ago. 34 years ago, my dad started his practice. Basically, the clinic was in our house. The uh, waiting room was the, uh, um, our dining room, basically. So um, 34 years ago, this is how we were. This is my dad and myself. And you can tell, I'm sure some of you can tell, that 34 years ago, they didn't use gloves. It was fine, but, um, and this is me polishing. I still love to polish <laughs> after all these years, and now I work with my dad, uh, and we work together. We manage uh, two offices, We're opening now another one. We're about like 60, 65 employees, and um, Hikma's growing, and, and I want to tell you that we, I practice six, six days a week almost. My wife hates it, but I try to work hard as much as, I pos as possible. And of course, we talked about aesthetics, but also I care much about function. And I want my restorations to last very long. I want them to look good, but I want them to last. And we place around like 1,500 to 1,600 implants a year. Um, so I need to control quality. I need to control long term. I don't want headache. I don't want re uh, redos. I hate redoing stuff. I hate redoing my work again. And um, this is what I'm going to share with you. And I'm going to talk about button selection and material selection, and basically ceramic material selection. Now we all learned, and I learned, that um, our surgeries are always prosthetic driven. And I used to always fight with my surgeons, you know, be always in the surgery. And I'm sure a lot of you do, you know, be with the surgery and try to be within the surgical guide and all that. But the last th three years, I guess, or three years and some, I have changed quite a bit of my concepts. And I believe it's not as much as prosthetic driven as much as I used to think. And that's because of the new abutment designs that are available, and of course, the new materials. Um, Eric Van Duren, Victor, Nuno, everyone, sh I mean, they showed beautifully how um, abutments and materials and all that are, are very important. But I might have a little bit of a different um, point of view. We meet in so many points, but um, a couple of points I'm going to share with you today. There's a lot of tips. Originally, of course, Brennemark had a very strict protocol. And we all know that, right? It was very strict. But nowadays, we're, we're pushing the envelope. And today's meeting is all about new trends. It's all about new and pushing the envelope and thinking different, thinking a bit of out of, thinking out of the box. My preference is always screw retain restorations all the time. And this is my preference. And the reason is, as I said, we place quite a bit of implants in our practice, and I want retrievability. I want control. I want to control the case. I want to control it even 10 years down the line, because we know everything fails in dentistry. No matter how good we are, we still fail. And we will fail if we succeed now. We are going to fail down the line. And I mean 10, 
15, 20 years, we are going to fail. And that's because we're dealing with materials. And I want to have control over my cases. So I do screw retained. Now, we have changed. We don't use metal anymore. These cases are very old. And, and that's where I uh, kind of differentiate a bit, uh, especially some speakers where they, um, there was metal involved in the, in, in the procedures when we don't use a lot of metal in our practice. Now, we all know th implant position is very important, right? Three-dimensionally, buccolingually, mesiodistally, and apicocoronally. Now, for me, I'm concerned most about the buccolingual position of the implant. And I'll tell you why. It's the position that most, mostly annoys me. And I guess today, from what I heard today in today's lecture, the buccolingual position is what is very important. And all the abutment selection revolves around the buccolingual um, placement of implants. And that's due to anatomical restrictions that we have. The maxilla resorbs by default upwards and inwards. And this is not something that we can control. It is just biology. It's just how humans are built. Maxilla resorbs upwards and inwards. We try to stop it. We try to minimize it. We try to build it with bone grafts and so on. But still, that's how we are. When we extract the tooth, because we know we all extract the bundle bone and the fibers are out, so we lose some, we lose some volume. Now, I took a stone model of a perfectly healthy person. And I'm just going to just bear with me for a couple of minutes, and I'll just draw some lines on the stone model. Okay, It's a central incisor. I sectioned in the middle. And I drew where I consider to be the ideal bone architecture. Right? Do you all agree that this is the ideal bone architecture, more or less? And usually when we place implants, the ideal placement is somewhere around there. It could be a bit buccally, a bit lingually, but it's somewhere around, this somewhere around this dimension. Now, this is what's, what is ideally called cement retained position. Why? Because it comes out through the incisal edge position. Now, a screw retained, screw retained position is usually the exit is a bit towards the cingulum to allow for the screw access. Now, this is the ideal. And we have bone to, can, to go cement or screw. But a lot of times, we don't have that. At least in my practice, I deal a lot with compromised situations. I'm sure a lot of you do. And the blue line is where the compromised situation is. We all agree that a lot of times, we see this, right? There's not a lot of bone left, especially not a lot of bone to go screw retained. Now, this is what I see usually, is a cross-section of a CT scan. and. The, 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 the cross-section of the tooth is where it has to be in the future. And if I place the implant here, which is encircled in bone, it's healthy, it's going to last long, there's no recession it's gonna, or minimal recession or, or no issue is going to happen. And this is a screw, or sorry, a cement-retained position because it comes out through this incisal edge position. Now, if I want to place in this compromised bone a screw retained position, I'm going to have the hissens, right? I'm going to have fenestration on the buccal bone. And therefore, I was taught in the perio department that we always go towards, we always do bone grafts, we build up the bone because we want to go screw retained, we want to go as much palatal as possible. But you know what? In real dentistry, real practice, not a lot of patients want to go through bone grafts. And I want to minimize biomaterials as much as possible. So what if we can place the implant in an ideal position, what I call the biological position? I don't have to worry about the prostheses. I don't have to worry about where the exit is. I just place the implant where there's the maximum amount of bone in the alveolus or in the surrounding bony structure. But I can still have its crew retained. So thinking a bit out of the box, where it's not something that we invented as dentists, it's not something that I invented. It's been a long time ago in the engineering concepts, where you can actually screw this screw with a screwdriver on an angle. 
Usually our screwdrivers, if you all pick up your screwdrivers at your office, you can only screw it perpendicular. You cannot go on an angle. And that's due to the way the screw is and the way the screwdriver is. But if I can screw my screw in an angle, if I can go up to 30 degrees, that would be great. This is what we see usually, right? This is what we see usually when we place the implants. We place it this way, right? Everyone does it that way, especially on the anterior. We go a bit more buckle because that's how the bone is, especially on extracted sites. When we engage the palatal bone, we have to go buckle. And so it's a cement retained. And I don't want to do cement retained. I want to stay away from cement retained. So going to the digital word, world, this case where we actually made the impression with the, um, uh, with the uh, uh, CAD CAM abutment. And you can notice here, with the scan body, I'm sorry, you can notice how I can control the axis of the implant. I can go 30 degrees in. And if you notice on the left side of the screen, on your right side, you can notice the cross section, how it's, the implant is going through the incisal edge, but I can still manage to get the screw axis on the palatal side or on the lingual side. It can allow me to move the axis or the ax of the implant on a 30 degree angle, which most of the cases are within 30 degrees. And this is something that MIS is coming up with, uh, which is the biaxial screw. It basically, it's a screw, if you notice the screw, how it looks like a ball, where you can actually put the screwdriver and still torque it to 30 or 35 Newton centimeter on a 30 degree angle. This way, I don't have to fight with my surgeon. I can tell him, place the bow implant wherever you want, within the 30 degree, which most, technici with mo which most clinicians do, and I can still angle it inwards and have it screw retained. And you can see the slot on the abutment where you can actually pull it back palatally. This is, these are the scan bodies, and this is the final prosthesis, and you can see how it's cemented. I just like, I'm not gonna show you the cementing process. Victor showed it. Every, I mean, there's a lot of people that showed how they, we cement it, and this is what we're doing nowadays. We're minimizing metal but we're having the interface in metal, but we're using zirconia, or we're using um, lithium desilicate or whatever. And you can notice here how the screw axis is going through the palate. You see a little video of how the axis is coming towards the palatal side. And I agree with um, Eric Van Duren and Victor that, that the abutment is golden in color. That helps us a lot with minimizing as much as possible that grayish, ugly look of the soft tissue. And it's only one abutment and it's only one screw. So I don't have to, do, I don't have to deal with two screws, I don't have to deal with multiple abutments or multi-unit abutments or whatever. Again, this is the case, this is after it's delivered and we've got good bone and you can see the screw axis is towards the pallet. Okay, now um, I just wanted, I just, bought, I just put this actually about an hour ago. I just wanted to put this case because Eric showed a beautiful case of how sometimes with these cases we've got the, the buckle side very thin that we can't mask it, we can't mask the high value of the zirconia, which I agree actually. And in 2005 we did this study when I was at USC where we actually placed the implant and you can see it's typical, it's placed towards the buckle, but um, and we did soft tissue, we, we augmented the soft tissue as much as possible with, with, with the soft tissue grafts. And we did a study where we, where we actually placed three types of abutments. One is gold nitrate to give this um, warm denting color, but still we failed. If you can see the, see the soft tissue, it still didn't look very good. Zirconia with a metal silver screw, it still has, if you notice, on the mid coronal part, you can still see a little bit of gray. But with a gold screw, it looks the best. So even the screw with these types of cases, especially on lateral incisors, even the screw color can make a difference. That's how um, detailed these cases are. Even the screw color can make a difference. And in this case, of course, it's done with the zirconia 
and the gold screw. This was done about 2005. Now, my domain is full arch restorations. I just wanted to share with you the concept, the concept of these abutments that actually changed the way I do dentistry with, with all my cases. Now, going to full arch restorations is a bit difficult, or sorry, it's a bit different, because now there's so many things involved. Now, in 2006, I'm going to share with you how I used to think and how I changed, because we change, right? We all learn from our mistakes. And in this case, I was still in residency, and we placed these implants perfectly placed, perfectly pa parallel implants. And my, my, um, my thinking, of course, is to do the Bentley option, right? To do ceramics on top of ceramics. Metal, PFM on the maxilla, and PFM on the mandible. This, is, this was our Bentley option. So eight implants in the maxilla, perfectly parallel, and eight implants or six implants in the mandible. I did my wax up, that's when I was a resident. I did my wax up and I did my even layer of ceramics just like my peers taught me. But still, and this is PFM. After, this is the case delivered, and after three or four months, the patient came back with a fractured or chip of the incisal edge. What happened? Why did that happen? And it happens a lot. And I talk to a lot of my colleagues that do layered ceramics. This happens. Now, I go back to my friends, right? These are my three friends. When I treatment plan, and I learned that from Pascal Mania, I really like it very much. It's basically, when you treatment plan any case, you have to use these three. One third, one third, one third. Evidence base, clinical experience, and your common sense. A lot of times, we have enough evidence base. And in some cases, we have actually no evidence base to support what we're doing. That's why we go to clinical experience, what our mentors are doing, or friends. And a lot of times, not even, we don't even have that, so we go to common sense. And in this case, I went to evidence, and I wanted to see why do these fractures happen, especially on the central incisor. And I, as I told you, we place a lot of implants, and any fracture like this on a big case like that, on a full arch, means that I have to redo everything. And I hate redoing stuff. So we went to the evidence, and we saw that there is really a lot of evidence, but it's maximum is three or four years, or maximum five years. And everyone has the same thing. Everyone tells us that these are from this, these pictures are from this article, that actually what happens with layered layered ceramics on zirconia, that the most problems have in is chipping. Even Paolo Malo the, um, uh, documented this 40% fractures. If you analyze the research, you'll notice that 30 to 40% chipping of ceramics. This is huge. If I have 1,500 implants placed, if I have 30 full arches in a year, that means that I have 30% of them failed. That's too much for me. So I go to the common sense, and common sense tells me that hard on hard versus ceramics versus ceramics, it will fail. Why? It's because your system is as strong as your weakest link. And what's the weakest link in our reconstructions? It's ceramics, right? It's the weakest link. So what do we do when it comes to material selection? When it goes ceramics versus ceramics? We try to do minimal controlled cutback or absolutely no cutback. And with the new materials that are available, and I'll show you now how we do this minimal cutback or absolutely, absolutely no cutback with these cases, with these full arch, uh, full arch restorations, I'm going to take you to the digital part of how we design. And if you can notice, the incisal edge is still in ceramics, sorry, it's still in zirconia. There is absolutely no ceramics placed on the incisal edge, because that's where the fractures happen, especially on the maxilla. And if you can notice here, using also this concept of the implant that we can angle it, you can notice how we have different angles on, the le on, your, left, on your right side of the screen. We have 28 degrees. So the surgeon actually, actually placed the implants wherever there is bone. He didn't even look at my surgical guide. And I went and I did everything, and I brought everything inwards. And you can notice 25 degrees, 30 degrees, 15 degrees, depending on the case. 
And this is, the, this is how the zirconia looks like after it's being milled. And just to show you quickly how still fine details, how I go with my technician and we finesse these um, interdental papillae between, with, with a burr in the green state when it's not sintered yet. And this is very important because a lot of technicians, what they do is after it's being sintered, they grind it and they induce all these cracks. So we go with these small burrs. So you can see we go with these small burrs interdentally and we, with the proximal strips that we use for composite or for veneer, whatever you use them in the, in the clinic, we clean between the teeth. We try to open up these spaces as much as possible to have no burrs touching zirconia after it's being sintered. So it looks pretty good. And then we go, after it's finished, we sinter it. And this is after it's being sintered. This is the full arch, sorry, before it's being sintered. And with only two bakes, we finish the case. The first bake is the full bake, and then we go secondary with the fine touches. And you can see we can give this, oh, sorry. We can give this um, illusion that there's incisal translucency, but there isn't. It's just an illusion. And you can notice with polar eyes how you can see only the ceramics on the buccal part. Everything else is in zirconia, maximum support. Hopefully nothing will fail. And so far we have absolutely no chipping. And you can notice how these implants are facially placed. Some of them are going buccally, facially, all over the place, but we still manage to get it screw retained. And I can still go with one screw and torque it down to 35 Newton centimeter. So I'm just going to go further because I have a lot of tips to show you. And this is the final. You can see the incisal edge of the centrals look pretty good in my, I think this looks pretty good. For patients, this look pretty good. They don't even notice these, um, the fine details, but for me, it looks pretty good. And this is before and after. Now going to uh, something else where it's a bit more of a, um, a challenge because there's not much bone left. And you can notice here how the patient did, doesn't have really a lot of bone in his, in his maxilla. He has remaining roots. He hates going to the dentist for the last 40 years. He just decided, you know what, he's going to do it. And take a look, taking a look at the Panorex, um, no bone. So we went and we placed um, as wherever we can place implants, and we placed four implants in the maxilla. And uh, we did it freehand, of course, and now what I'm trying to do with Christian and with the DSD virtual lab is trying to make everything digital. And I'm, I'm glad I heard the lecture before me. They talked about a lot of stuff. Um, however, a um, couple of things I will share with you now about why is digital very important, because it will help us with taking, taking the provisional prostheses to the definitive very easy and very quick. Anyway, so this, you can see there's not a lot of bone, so we're going to do some resection to allow, um, this is the try-in, we're going to do some resection to allow for the pink, um, uh, the pink transition. There's no way we can build that much uh, bone back and have this interdental papillae augmented, so resection is the best. This is the try-in. We took the patient's approval, and we went and extracted the teeth. Very easy, of course, extracting these teeth, two or three minutes. And in the middle section, you notice how we leveled the bone. We brought everything up to allow for the pink to look good and still have this perfect papillae where the patient, when he smiles, you can see them. And we don't have to worry about different heights of implants and all this uh, problems that are gonna happen with the prosthesis. So always leveling the bone give us, gives us freedom when we work, as, especially as a prosthodontist and lab technicians. So we place, as I've heard from everyone, we place the multi-unit abutments. And the nice thing about multi-unit abutments, that even if we have a hundred degree, a hundred degree difference in angulation, we can still have it screw retained. It goes up to a hundred degrees with these nice multi-unit abutments. On the left side, or on your right side, is where the immediate loading is finished. We torque it down to about uh, 15 or 20 and the patient goes home with a nice um, uh, provisional prosthesis within like an hour and a half. This is done by hand, nothing digital, um, just to show you that they, we are allowing, allowing room for pink. And these are the multi-unit abutments. 
to move everything up, to move everything to the tissue level, not worrying about bone or not worrying about blood or none of that, going all the way up, uh, trying to work as much, as, as much clean as possible. Now that's where the digital comes, and that's what uh, the guys at the DSD lab, which I really agree with what they're doing, is moving from the provisional prostheses to the final. That's where the digital is really important. And that's what we're trying to work, hopefully, in the future cases with, uh, with the guys. And you can see this is our trial prosthesis. It's all wax. We took all the information from the immediate load, and we went to the trial prosthesis. The nice thing about multi-unit abutments is that we can use these uh, um, healing abutments on top to actually use them as friction. And we can put, we can actually click this um, trial or try-in, aesthetic try-in, to be able to see the case and see how it looks, how good it looks, occlusion, and so on and so forth. So it actually goes in very nicely, snugly, and we can make sure that occlusion is fine. And going again to the digital world, uh, so far we've mastered this. We're doing very, very well with it. Um, again, the same thing, even with healing abutments, or sorry, even with multi-unit abutments, we can still go up to 15 degrees 15 degrees is our play, even with these nice healing abutments because they're very conical. So this is the uh, final, uh, sorry, this is the final prosthesis. After it's being sintered, and you can notice how it's translucent. There's incisal edges and the uh, occlusion is all in zirconia. Nothing's gonna break, hopefully. Um, it's very nice and translucent. And we go again with two bakes only. This is the first bake. This is our first bake. And then the second bake is only just to do the finesse and the stippling and so on and the line angles. And that's it. We're done. I mean, who can tell that this is without cutback, without the incisal edge being cut back? No one can tell. At least patients cannot tell. And you can see the details of the papillae are all done because we did a proper minimal cutback in the digital world. No burrs are being touched, no burrs have touched the ceramics whatsoever, the zirconia. And the delivery is being done really nicely uh, with these healing, with these multi-unit abutments. What I like about MIS in particular, that the screws that go on top of the healing, uh, on top of the multi-unit abutments, we can torque up to 30 newton centimeter. And you can see I'm torquing up to 30 newton centimeter. Um, unfortunately, you can see in other places, you don't have that pleasure, you don't have that um, um, torquing to 35. They usually always tell you only 15 or 20 maximum, so you got a lot of screw loosening. So 35 newton centimeter is what we can go up to, which is great. This is the final being done, and you can see the CT scan, V3 implants, there's a lot of bone around. Um, hopefully these implants are gonna last for a long time. So this is the final, and again, the incisal edges look pretty good to me. I'm not going to bore you with that. And then again, finally, um, going fully, no cutback whatsoever. With these cases, again, the same scenario. Patient comes in with really lousy dentures. We do our aesthetic try-ins, and then we place the implants, multi-unit abutments, immediate loading, taking all the information from the immediate loading um, prostheses and doing the final design, but full contour zirconia, absolutely no ceramics. This is for patients that grind, patients that show signs of bruxism. It's the best. So only doing uh, ceramics on the gingival part, on the pink part, and this is the case, being done, finished, upper and lower, absolutely no ceramics whatsoever. You get really nice value, patients love it. Um, it looks really strange on the x-ray. We're not used to it, but um, it's, it's just amazing. So um, the details of the incisal edges, the details of the surface texture, we can all do that with um, the digital, in the digital world. And you can see everything flows very nicely. And the translucency of those materials, of those materials is amazing. Last thing, I'm just going to take one minute just to show you. Last thing, what we do is for these special patients that require high aesthetics, this is my last resort. I'm not going to do ceramics on zirconia. Cut back, no way. But for special patients that demand high aesthetics, 
we go and we do these um, types of prostheses. I'll show you very quickly, again, the same scenario, the same protocol, immediate provisionalization. Patient is happy, happy, the occlusal plane is good, occlusion is good. I'm gonna do my wax try-in, taking all the information from the immediate prostheses. But in this case, we're going to do a hand frame, full frame zirconia, but with individual units that are made out of full contour Emacs. So again, we are not doing any layering whatsoever. So these are the full frames made out of zirconia, and we've got individual um, units. We only layer the pink, absolutely no stress. This is not gonna fracture whatsoever. And then we cement these, uh, and you can see the translucency of them is amazing. It's lithium desilicate. Um, individual units, still a screw retained, because we can still um, have these holes inside the, or the middle of the, abut of the middle of the crowns. And again, as Victor showed very nicely, the way we um, have these uh, lithium desilicate on top of the zirconia with screws to allow for screw retained prostheses, but still allowing the titanium bases to be s glued in the lab. We glue them in the lab following the same uh, protocol that he talked about. I actually sandblast, Victor. I like to sandblast my prostheses. I don't like to rely only on uh, chemical adhesion. Um, I don't know why, but I like mechanical. I like to make sure that there's a lot of mechanical um, retention, so I sandblast them always. Um, again, maybe I'm just a control freak, but I like to, I like to have maximum control. So these are the um, um, titanium abutments, and we cement them in the lab. So I'm, I'm finished. This is the final prosthesis. Again, you can see amazing um, aesthetics because we have Emacs involved. And the nice thing about it, if anything fractures here, we only replace a single crown. We just do regular crown and bridge. We don't have to remove the whole thing. And this is the final and beautiful aesthetics. Thank you very much. I am just on time. Thank you.